Welcome to the Growing Up Bananas podcast, where we dissect the perks and tribulations of being bananas. It's hard being yellow when I feel so white. My name is Ethan. Alex is sitting next to me and in many ways I'm sitting next to her. What do we have in store for today? We are lucky enough to finally be joined by Straw Hat Stephen, brother of our founding podfather, Sam. We're going to get an insight into the mind of the so-called brawn of the family, as well as chat about his love for watch collecting and even discuss a few of his favorite pieces. So let's get into it. And especially like grades, I remember like every time we got the report cards, like it was I was very fearful. I was like fearing my life. I actually went to Korean school for like five to ten years and my speaking ability did not improve at all because I just went there to play. Or just like I'd say Asians in general were finally getting like some kind of acknowledgement on like the world stage. Like previously it'd just be like America would be like the only ones or whatever and my brother was one of the biggest guys in his grade and then he reminds me all the time (laughs) yeah uh, he actually was he was so big like um (laughs) not many people believe this when i say it but i benched 180 before i recently picked up a rose gold daytona um with the ivory dial and i thought that was going to be like a really special piece for me so before we start i've got a question for you Okay. It can be at any point or any time in your life. Can you think of one or two Asian songs that you just loved that you could not understand the lyrics to because you don't speak Chinese? Do any pop into your head? Oh, that's a good one. Um, let me have a think of that. Uh, think about it. Uh... Where you just felt, oh, this must be such an emotional song, but you don't know what the F is being said. I can't, re- I can't remember the name of the song, but I... The one song that always makes me really emotional is probably in that One Liter of Tears Japanese drama. Which which song? Because there's quite a few good songs. I can't tell. I can't remember if it's the, is it the school song? It might be the school song or the one that's always playing in the background. Like every time a sad scene happens, like there's the one scene where the dad screams at Aya and then it just, which is his daughter's name. It, is it the one with the guitar? I think, yeah, it's probably that yeah. one. Um, but it's just really emotional and I have no idea what they're saying, but it gets me every time because I also think that it's just the emotion of that, the move, that like everything that's happening in that movie should or drama should watch it One Leader of Tears. If you want a good cry, you're going to get a good cry watching One Leader of Tears. Yeah, and if you don't want to cry, don't watch it. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty rough. Um, but that's probably... I'm trying to think. There's a lot of songs that I listen to and I have no idea what they're singing other than the one or two English words that they throw in um, that I still enjoy, like a lot of the K-pop music, all of Big Bang songs, all of Epic High, the OGs. Um, but how about you? I can't really think of anyone top of the head. Probably that song from um, Stairway to Heaven, the Korean drama, the main song. Oh, the for Yongwon Yi, like. Uh, I think so. Like the top again, of I think. I have no idea what it's about, but again, because of the, the drama and how sad the show is, you just feel like it's about something that's pretty rough and pretty sad. So, well, I thought that would just be something interesting to talk about. Yeah. Um, if, the, if other people, I'm sure there's so many out there that I can't think of now, but. The, oh, the Koreans just know how to pull your heartstrings. Their OSTs, like soundtracks for yeah. their dramas, are always just spot on and we've been talking about it the last couple of episodes and probably with steven it's just about how like the korean aesthetic the feel about it it just draws you in when you don't know or we don't know what they're actually talking or singing about so we'll get into that but let's yeah. get steven on it's gonna be a good chat and uh it's gonna be some interesting things i'm sure he's gonna bring up i'm excited go yep this podcast is part of the deluxe edition network to find other great shows on the network head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Many thanks to the Deluxe Edition Network for voting us Podcast of the Month. Please check out the other winner as well, Inner Pickle Radio Show. Thanks again to the Deluxe Edition Network.
So it's been a long time coming, but we're lucky to be joined by the slightly more athletic, uh, and in the words of our co-pod father, Sam, physically more impressive, but intellectually inferior younger brother, Straw Hat Steven. Steven's a lover of animals. He practically lives in the gym. He's my go-to guy when it comes to watches. And most importantly, he can heal you if you ever get injured. Welcome, Straw Hat. Thank you for the welcome. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thanks for being here, man. Look, um, the first thing that I always ask everyone now is, do you consider yourself a banana? Right now, I consider myself more Korean than Australian, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. and I guess that ch- changed over time. Yeah, when I was younger, definitely a banana. I felt white on the outside for sure. All my friends were uh, Australian, born Australians. And um, over time, I think I've um, made more friends with uh, Koreans, which is my race. Yeah, we'll we'll talk a lot about that um, as we go forward. So we kind of know a little bit about your family from Sam, see your older brother. Um, What are your memories of like your really early life, have you ever spoken to your parents about why they came from Korea? I actually haven't. I actually haven't. Um, we, I think my sister and my brother have talked to my parents about it generally, but I think the overall vibe was like they um, just came here to have a better life for their children and that was it. Yeah. 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 Talking to Sam, I think your parents left a lot of family back home. Yeah, I mean that would probably would have been the hardest thing in terms of um, – uh, I guess leaving all their friends and family and coming here, but I guess for the future of their own family, they kind of sacrificed it to um for the brighter future. Yeah, yeah, which didn't turn out that bright. In what way? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe it's like not as bright as they thought. I don't know. But I think they're they're very happy. They consider themselves like like Australians. They're very comfortable here, and um, yeah, they can't imagine moving back. Yeah. What's it like for your family that are back there? Are they fairly, I don't know, so well off? That's not what I'm looking for, uh, but like, are they pretty happy, content? Um, I'd say 80% are. There is like an uncle and cousins that m- wanted to move here as well for a better life. I guess financially they weren't as um, high up there as the other family, but they were still getting by, but um, they there was a period where they were definitely set on coming here. And they were organizing things, but it fell through. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so we know that you're a middle, middle child. You got Jenny, younger sister, and obviously Sam. What's the relationship like between the three of you? At the moment or like in the let's, past? Let's, let's, <laughs> when you guys were younger. younger. Yeah. I think, um, is this a bait? <laughs> <laughs> it can be. <laughs> I think Jenny was loved by my mum and dad a lot um, and my brother maybe resented that a little bit. Okay. I, I didn't mind. I didn't care. Yeah. But poss- it's possible. I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, yeah. there's two parents, three kids. Yeah. Like, it's never going to be equal. Yeah. No she, she was the first girl as and well. Yeah. I was gonna say, and Jenny is much younger than you both as yep. well. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. What's the age gap? Six years. Between you and her? For, yeah, and seven yeah, right. years for me and, me and Sam, yeah. Yeah, but, well, um, Sam's 45, so <laughs> obviously a big age gap there. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was understandably more loved and I think um, my brother, because he was, yeah, he was definitely, um, when he saw that, I guess maybe, oh, sorry, Sam. Do it. <laughs> So, no, I feel like I've already said too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. So, yeah. so yeah, potentially she was loved. She was the daughter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Much prettier than the two of you as well. So <laughs> there's, there's those sorts of things that come into play. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, and the relation in terms of like the relationship between us three, yep. I think we were never like that, the siblings that are like, you know, like if we've got spare time, we'll go out to cafe together or something. But like when we were together – it was good, like, but it's not like we we're like best friends, but like just like regular siblings, I think. Yeah. yeah. What What was it? Do you think you guys just had different interests, or um, age it, Age is a big factor, I think, as well. Um. Oh, with me and my sister, yeah, like just very different people. Like you know, with like that MBTI stuff, she's like super the organized one, and I'm like 
the like the unorganized one same with mobala so like it like kind of like like yeah. doesn't match yeah um so yeah and personality as well different friend groups uh, different age as you said so it's a lot of things but i think we just have a separate like family life and friends life but good family life when we're together i guess yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool mm. and then what's your memories of like growing up with your parents were they like strict on you guys uh, my parents were very strict um, up until I'd say grade, like maybe late high school. Um, they were very, very, very strict. So with grades, studying, uh, like sports, like they just always wanted us to be the best we could be. Yep. Um, and especially like grades, I remember like every time we got the report cards, like it was, I was very fearful, like. I was like fearing my life <laughs> when the day we got the report cards um, because um, I knew like if I got like a C or something, you know, something was going down to that night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Do you guys get tutoring? Um, we tried once. I tried once and I was like, no, I'm not doing it. And I don't know if my brother ever did, but I went once and – it to me it wasn't like because like they were teaching stuff but like in a different way to how they were teaching it. So yeah. I was like, oh, I think this is more trouble than it's worth. Like learning two was different it Kumon methods. Or was it what? Sorry? Was it Kumon or North Shore? Um, it was in um, Gold Coast okay. on the Gold Coast. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because like when we're talking to Sam about it, he felt like he wasn't really pushed, wasn't under too much pressure from your parents. So it's interesting to see the difference to sides, study to study. Oh. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it doesn't mean one's wrong or right. It's just a different experiences. Yeah. So maybe for you, you felt a little bit more yeah. pressure than him. Yeah. I think oh, they always wanted a good balance of life, like, but study was definitely one of those things. Um, but I think once we hit a certain age, they just kind of dropped it all and, like, you're an adult now. You just do what you want. Mm. It was kind of like um, very Western approach. Yeah. Like, yeah. And since then, I'd say maybe grade 10, 11, 12, um, they just treat us as like complete adults. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can imagine for them, they've given up a lot to come to Australia. Yeah. They obviously wanted you guys to have that better life that, that they moved for. Yeah. So at, when they were young, they're really trying to guide you guys and push you in the right direction. They probably realized you guys were okay as you got a bit older. I'm not sure why they stopped, to be honest. It was, I, I thought it was like they kind of just gave up on us. Like they knew, like, this isn't like no matter what, like they're just going to do what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And that, like especially with guys, like there's a certain stuff, like amount of stuff you can control and they just kind of, I don't know, I've never asked them. but Were you guys rebellious? Um, Like at that age? Like hormones, like, you know, you're going through puberty. Like maybe that's why they're just like whatever. They're just going to. Maybe a little bit. Um, Maybe a little bit, yeah. yeah. I think Sam was – yeah, he was pretty um emotional. Yeah, he still is. Yeah. <laughs> I I was yeah, I'd say we both kind of were, but not not like crazy, but just yeah, we were a little bit. Just yeah. boys growing up, yeah. trying to find yourselves. Did you guys grow up speaking Korean? A lot of Korean? I mean, I So I know your parent like know your parents. And I know that your dad and your mom can speak English, your dad I think more than your mom. Yeah. So then growing up, did you guys predominantly speak English at home or was it mainly Korean? Um, when we were younger, she, uh, or my mum always, and my dad always forced us to speak Korean at home. So if we spoke like any English, we would get, um, in trouble. Um, but I guess at some point when we went to school, we were talking in English more and the Korean was kind of being forgotten. And we just, we just couldn't, like, I've never spoken to my brother in Korean like I never called him Hyung, which is what a guy calls a older brother. older brother. Yeah. So um, I think at some point it just like if you're just so comfortable with English, you can't just suddenly speak Korean at home. Yeah, so especially as, among siblings, so. you like you find it weird almost. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent weird. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think yeah, at when we're really young, all Korean, but as time, it's only natural for if it's your natural like tongue to. To just speak English, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of kids 
in Australia or in a Western or English speaking country, you don't see the need to speak your cultural language. Yep. Which is kind of where we were. And then I guess you said you've sort of turned it around and now you're a bit more Korean than what you were when you were growing up. Yeah. Well, when I was younger, I thought I would never speak Korean in my life. I would never need it. So I actually went to Korean school for like five to 10 years. Yeah, right. And my speaking ability did not improve at all because I just went there to play. Like I was like, in my head, I was like, I'm never going to need this like anyway. So I'll just, I just went there to play with my friends. But it was only like when I started working um, that like later on in life that I realized how important or even before that, just how important it was. And um, I'm still happy for like being grateful towards my parents for sending me there because at least like I have like some kind of base knowledge of the language yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a really good point. I guess take us through your schools then. So you were saying at the start that you guys did go to predominantly white schools? Yep. Um, I guess growing up on the Gold Coast is predominantly, especially like back then, it was predominantly white. And um, yeah, we it was, I'd say in primary school, there was maybe like a few Asians in my grade. I can't even remember, but like not many at all, maybe yeah. one or two. And in high school, there was more, maybe 10 a grade, but it was, yeah, predominantly um, uh, Australians where where I went on the Gold Coast. How did you feel? Did you feel like you were an outcast because of race or did you not really reflect on it? Oh, uh, I think there were times, I think because most of my friends were white as well in Australia and I still, I'm still really close with some of them today, but when times I experienced racism, uh, which didn't happen like often, yeah. but when it did, then I definitely felt a difference. Um, maybe that like, this isn't where I was like, this isn't where I'm supposed to be kind of mm. thing. And just fast forwarding it, like when I went to Korea for the first time um, as an adult, I was at the airport, I remember, and all the workers were Korean, you know, the people there were Korean. And I was like, oh, this is like where I should be. Kind of, I just remember cool. kind of having that thought, wow. yeah. yeah. And it was really like one of the most exciting times, like all feelings that I've had, um, is going to Korea for that first time as an adult because um, I kind of feel like, like I kind of felt like, oh, this is where I could have lived and where like I'm from and where I belong in a way. It's like yeah. going back yeah. to your roots. Yeah, yeah. The culture. Yeah. Not saying like he is bad, <laughs> but like it was just like very different, yeah. Yeah, no, we'll definitely touch on that Um soon on that that sort of sense of belonging if you want to call it that you mentioned like a little bit of bullying like you say it was just typical things name calling um yeah and i actually think i had a pretty good compared to like say if there was an age like a i can't remember what they call it like fresh off the boat yeah like Asians. um work exchange or something exchange oh, exchange, exchange unit yeah yes. like for those people like who can't really like say anything for themselves because it's not like their like mother tongue but for me, it wasn't as bad because I was like just friends with a lot of like I had a lot of friends and stuff and it wasn't that bad. But when I, I did see it where there were people that were more vulnerable. Um, it's because you can yeah. speak proper English. Yeah. And yeah. commas and yeah. they couldn't. And so the people like, oh, but you kind of a strong because you can kind of talk English. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Then, yeah. So people would have seen them as like an easy target in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's fair enough. So Sam mentioned that because of you, you actually cost him a very good education at a certain school. Um, oh, yeah. Apparently you had an interview with a principal and they asked you what your favourite subject at school was and you, as a larrikin you may have been when you were a kid, said it was lunch. Mm. Sam reckons that's what cost you guys to get into this certain school. Can you remember that at all? I do, I do, because my... It was a day where my parents were very uh, filthy at me and my brother. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we went into this um, school. I won't say the name. No need. Did Sam say the name? No. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, we went to that school and um, we were already at a nice private school, but this, I think my parents may have considered this one better. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, went for an interview and it was going good, like just me and my brother, my parents and the two principals and then – um. Yeah, one of the questions towards the end was like, yeah, what's your favourite subject? And then I, I honestly said lunchtime because it was. Well, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And 
I don't think he reacted badly. And then he asked, he turned around and looked at my brother and he's like, what about you? And my brother was like, uh, the same. <laughs> like, mine's lunchtime too. And then I was like, I didn't think anything badly, like, because we we're just being honest. And then at the end, like a few minutes later, like, they took my parents off. We could still hear them. They were just to the side, like a few meters away. And they're like, I don't think your parents, uh, your children are fit for this school. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was like yeah. on the like, same day. I think that's how I remember it. Yeah. Um, so, oh my gosh. yeah, my parents didn't grill us or anything, but they just didn't say anything. Like, <laughs> you could feel the shame. Yeah. So how old were you guys? I actually don't know. Maybe I'd say if I had to guess, maybe like. Like 11 or 12? Grade 8 or something. Grade oh, 9. Okay. I actually don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Can't remember. <laughs> well, I mean, in hindsight, I'd say that didn't, that's not the reason you guys didn't get there. Yeah, here Sam is blaming poor we Stephen. Can, we can still blame Stephen. Yeah. Hey, Sam said the same thing. Yeah, well, actually true. He never said that he agreed yeah, with he you. Admitted, oh, really? Yes, he admitted that. Yeah. He also said that lunch was his favourite subject. He probably forgot about it. Yeah, yeah that's how I, yeah, that's how I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, well, good memories, right? Yeah. And the funny thing is, my sister, she was really good at, like very talented at piano and I, she got a scholarship at maybe two or three different schools and that school was one of them yep. and she was deciding where she where she should go and me and my brother both said don't go to that school <laughs> but she ended up going to that school <laughs> yeah so what, what were you like during school like were you academic were you athletic I was a mix of everything so I was not super smart, but relatively smart. I liked all play, liked and played all sports. Yeah. Um, I wasn't into like the cultural stuff, like dancing, singing, that kind of stuff. But sports and academics and social life just um, was all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all really good. I had a really good um, high school experience. Oh, that's yeah. cool, man. Yeah. yeah. So for you, I guess it's good to hear that because a lot of other Asian Australians didn't. Some yeah. some felt outcasted. Some couldn't really find their niche. Um, speaking to Sam, we've said it so many times this podcast, like we had sport and different things that we could kind of rely on. Yeah, to to find friends. I think um, that's definitely the case for me as well because I like played sport, like all sports, and was like good at. Like, I don't want to say this myself, but like, <laughs> I was I was pretty good at like all sports. Like I wasn't like the best, but I was pretty good. So I guess being good at sports just. There's a, um, like, regardless of, like, your culture or whatever, like, it just has a healthy respect amongst, especially guys, I think. Yep. Um, so that was definitely a thing in me being able to kind of just have, like, friends and I think that was a contributing factor for sure. So being well-rounded helped. But mainly sport. Yeah, mainly yeah sport. I'd say sport yeah. was a big thing, yeah. What, so what, were you, what did, like, what did you play? Honestly... Everything like we did swimming, volleyball, golf, rugby, touch, soccer, tennis. Yeah, right. You did play everything. Like yeah, like there's probably stuff that I forgot. Basketball. Um, volley, uh, like water polo, um, yeah, cause basketball. It, cause Sam yeah. said you guys were like you used to do swimming lessons, and you guys were both pretty good swimmers. Yeah, we well we we did swimming lessons like every day, like four a.m. Sucks. woke up went to yeah like it was dark and we just had to do that every day and we went to like an all-girls school as well to do it which at this time would be not bad but back then <laughs> i didn't care yeah um yeah but no nah, i'm just joking <laughs> <laughs> just joking seriously. Um, yeah um yeah so yeah it was tough honestly swimming was tough because it was forced on us like no one likes just swimming laps yeah but oh, yeah it's the training that kills you yeah yeah, right. No, that's cool, man. Um, it's good to get a nice kind of um, overview of your school experience. So then take us through once you've left school, you said you kind of found yourself a little bit more the Korean side. Yeah, so I think it all changed when I was at uni. So I went to University of Queensland yep. and um, there were a lot more Asians. Like yeah. I'd never been exposed to that many Asians and I was like, Back in high school, it was like weird being Asian. It was like the odd one out. But at UQ, I was like kind of more part of the environment kind of thing. So that was kind of one thing. But still I was like um, – so I was more comfortable 
with Asians when I was there. And like when you meet new people, I'm comfortable with everyone, but I guess because we share the same look, I guess it yeah. might be a bit more comfortable. Um, but that first time I went to Korea was when my perception started changing and I really started to embrace um, being a Korean. Before that, like when I was younger, you know, you could even say I was ashamed at points yep. to be um, to be Korean. Well, what made you go to Korea in the first place? A group of friends like um, were going, and um, yeah, we, I just I didn't want to go actually. Um, I would, like really didn't want to go, but I just was like, okay, we're going as a group. Let's just go, and just going on to like being ashamed. Like I remember my mom packed me like kim. It's like a Korean sushi called kimbap. Yeah, and I remember one time someone said like, oh, what stinks? And then I was about to open it and then I remember that time someone said What's, what stinks and then I like put it back away. Yep. And then looking back I was like, oh, like that was pretty like stupid. Like I kind of feel stupid for thinking that. But yeah, that's what I thought at oh, the well, time. You, at the time you don't have the confidence, you don't have the, I don't know, self-worth. You just kind of want to fit in. Yeah, by any yeah. Means. So um, yeah, that was a memory like that I had, yeah. Yeah. Many of us have experienced that, just going to school and then you're like, oh, what, what is that smell? You're like, it's fried rice or like noodles or something. And they're just like, ugh. And yeah. you're like, I mean, if I had the courage now, I would have been like, try it for yourself. You're missing out. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the world has changed a lot as well. So like it's back then it was just so such a new thing. But now it's, you know, everyone's pretty, well, most people are pretty um accustomed to it. Yeah, you can't yeah. even get a bloody seat at some Korean restaurants anymore. You yeah. Know, wait, out, wait out the front for half an hour, which sucks. Exactly. And you always see, and it makes me happy when I see like white people or different nationalities just eating at Korean restaurants or into like Korean stuff. Like just, yeah, it's just like a, a good, a good thing. It's like yeah. acceptance. Yeah. Feel accepted. Yep. Yeah. 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 But it like, it does suck like it, we like it wasn't like, I didn't feel that when, or we didn't feel that when we were a bit younger. Yeah. yeah. And that's, to be honest, that like, what you just said there is kind of the whole reason why Sam and I started this was because I didn't know him during school. And then as we got closer and talked more, we're like, man, what were you like? And then we all, we both had the same experience of sometimes we were ashamed. We didn't really fit in, kind of found ourselves after school. Yeah. And everyone we've spoken to has a very similar experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's cool that I guess it's exactly the same for you mm. to, to reiterate all that. And always being like the token Asian. Like that's yeah. like the joke. Well, unlike for you, like you went to an Asian school, but like, yeah, for like yeah. I was one of maybe two or three Asians. I only went to an Asian school when I was mm. like 15, 16. So yeah, that's the important years. I know, but still like growing up, I still would have felt like a yeah. banana. But, well, yeah. <laughs> as you said though, as things have changed nicely now with you know Asian culture being more prevalent, the rise of Korea, so K-pop and, <laughs> and trade K-dramas and things. Must You must be pretty, I want to say proud, but it must be cool that it's kind of coincided with yourself yeah. being more, more proud of your heritage. Yeah, I definitely, like when I remember when stuff like Squid Games and stuff was like when that's, those shows were popular and there's still like heaps of Korean dramas which are really popular like and you like, Blackpink or whatever that were like you know really well known worldwide in Western countries as well. I guess it does. It, I wouldn't say proud is the right word, but just like maybe relief, maybe like oh like with like Koreans are finally getting like or just like I'd say Asians in general yeah. were finally getting like some kind of acknowledgement on like the world stage. Like previously, it'd just be like America would be like the only ones or whatever, but. Now I feel like um, we've got some good representation. Yeah, there. yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone always probably jokes with you when they find out you're Korean. They're like, "Oh, what? You into K-pop? You must like watch. You must watch K-dramas and all uh, those things." Uh, yeah, sometimes <laughs> it does happen. Um, it does happen sometimes, but not often. Not often. Yeah, yeah probably because I don't go out much. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, we know you're a avid watcher of Singles Inferno. How do you, um, how do you know that? Ah, oh, it's just well known. Really? <laughs> I haven't told anyone. It's out there now. <laughs> <laughs> but we, all, we all watched it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we did. Kind of talking about it before off camera. So 
obviously, like, you know, the women in Singles Inferno and Korean dramas, they're all very attractive. Um, for us, growing up in a Western culture, all we saw was Western women. So when you were young, did what was kind of your, did you have a preference or did you kind of think, all right, well, I see Western women everywhere. That's what I think I want. Or that's what I think I'm going to end up with. Yeah, I only um, looked at Western females. Um, dating an Asian or liking an Asian was not, it did not enter my mind. Like it was like, um, yeah, it's just not something I thought of. Was yeah. it because, so we know, like my, my cousin um, who lives in France, he's always thought, no, I'm not ever going to date an Asian woman because it'd be like dating my mom. Oh, okay. And yeah. so like that's why he's so adamant that he doesn't want to date. Mm. an Asian woman. So I've always been curious as to like whether guys, as you, like all you guys, have ever had that same thought. Like, oh, do I really want to date an Asian woman? I live in Australia. There's heaps of different women out there. Has that thought ever crossed your minds or not really? Like, like as a younger? As in like, oh, I'd be like dating my mom. No, no, I've never thought that. I just, when I was younger, I just never found Asian women attractive. Yeah. How about you yourself? Yeah, I, I'm probably the same. I mean, firstly, there were none. Mm where I lived um, and secondly yeah you just you're not seeing the quality that's out there um, in the media it's probably another one or yeah even, even not even in the media just in person like growing up in a rural town um, a few guys on the Gold Coast may be a little bit different but <clears throat> yeah not sure yeah but now um, you know <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we know you, you know do you know? No. Okay. Um, yeah, now Now I like, you know, all types of women. Okay. But yeah. I'd say um, I'm mostly, I would say, attracted to Koreans because we're just the most relatable. Yeah. And I like talking in Korean as well. Yeah. So um, even though I'm not good, but I still like it. So, but yeah, like, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, the last thing about, uh, I suppose, the Korean side is, like, professionally, we won't have to go into details on what you do or anything, but professionally, like, we've had chats and you said it's really helped having that Korean to go back to. A lot of your clients um, are that. So can you think of any other positives that have come your way because of your culture? Um, I would say just, like, building relationships and work. Work is like a huge one because it just opens up a huge clientele for myself because I'm Korean and I'm a physio. Um, and it's not like Koreans only want to see Koreans, but some there's a lot of Korean patients who can only speak Korean and are, don't, can't convey what they want to say uh, properly through English. So yeah. um, it really does help with work. Um, and... That's actually when I started learning Korean. I think in my first job, I noticed a few Korean patients coming through. So I, I get I got tutoring maybe for two or three months, um, and then like before that, I couldn't really say a sentence properly. But um, after that, um, I became uh, a little bit better and was able to have conversations and and um, yeah, that helped a lot. No. Two months, you picked up pretty quickly. I suppose you had a pretty yeah. good base to go off. Yeah, I think because we, because I went to, again, my parents sending me to Korean school. They, it, there was like it wasn't like starting from scratch. So it was, um, yeah, that was that was good. Do you speak yeah. to your parents in Korean when you're I, at home? I do, I do at the moment. Um, I think when I was younger, it was a bit mixed. Um, and with my, yeah, with my grandma who's in Korea. Like even now when I speak to her, it's, it, I can't really s communicate with her properly because her Korean's like very advanced, yeah. 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 And then what's it like when you go back now? Because for a lot of Asian Australians like around our age, when they go back, some can speak, some can't speak, either Chinese or Vietnamese or whatever it is, yeah. you can. And you kind of you spoke a little bit about that like sense of um, being home, belonging. What's it like now when you guys go back mm. to Korea? Um, in terms of that belonging thing, so I did feel that at the start when I first went and the first few times I went after that because after I felt that the first time, I was like, oh, I'm going to go back. Yeah. So I went back like every year or two. But after that, I was like, I felt a sense of not belonging there. So I was like, like after like two weeks, I'd be like, oh, okay, it's time to go back home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's kind of reverse. Like I'm, it's kind of like in the middle. 
Yeah. So like, why is that? Like, why? What? Like, what made you switch from like your mindset feeling, of feeling like yeah. you belong to then feeling like, oh, actually, oh. I don't really belong here. I'd say a few things like my ability to speak Korean and just my life isn't over there. It's it's here, and I can't imagine living over there and um. Yeah, like family, friends, everyone's over here and this is like where I belong. Was that much of a cultural shock for you when you were in Korea though? Um, There was at the start. Honestly, I can't remember, but I remember there was um, like things that I was so shocked about, like subways being so busy, um, how people, people everywhere. Yeah, how people talk to each other and, and things like that. Um, yeah, just a very busy city life, yeah. Yeah, and then now, like, do you still try to go back yeah. as much as you can? Yeah, I'd say every two years. Um, one of my uh, best friends, uh, Justin, lives over there, so um, shout out to Justin. Am I allowed to do that here? <laughs> of course. Justin. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> um, nice yeah, 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 he um, yeah, he lives over there, so I go back to see him and just hang out and, you know, go to, like, internet cafes, just, like, um, yeah, eat good food, stuff yeah. like that, yeah. That's the main reason why we want to go is for the food. Yeah. yeah. I think it'll be good. Yeah. It's... So Sam spoke about how intellectually he steamrolls you. I quote him verbatim. But you have the benefit of a, a better physique, which is, is obvious. Um, <laughs> in, terms, in terms of your training, like you said you were pretty athletic. You did swimming and you played all sports. Um, now I think you said you kind of mainly just work out in the gym. Yeah. Um, when did that kind of start in um, terms of like proper training? I started gymming when I was, I think, grade in the grade 10. So me, my brother and this other close friend, Harrison, we went together. And um, my, my brother and Harrison were probably the two biggest, like Harrison was in my grade. He was like the biggest guy in my grade. Yep. And my brother was one of the biggest guys in his grade. And yeah, then, he reminds me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he actually was. He was so big, like... um. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, so we used to train together and I've trained like properly since, like I've always been into gym. I love the feeling of like taking pre-workout um, and just having a really good session, getting a pump. Um, doesn't ha- happen that much anymore because I, I don't have any desire to be like, like have a really good like physique or for, yeah, or for any purpose. It's just for like general health. Yeah. And, like, just a little bit of, like, muscle gain and stuff like that. Yeah, but in terms of, like, my brother being intellectually, um, what do you say? Steamrolled me. Steamrolled you was, was his word. What are, you, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Uh, I think um, I always thought my sister was definitely the smartest out of us, like, us three siblings. So when it goes from my sister to me to my brother. Yeah, yeah, I thought <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, I thought so too. Yeah. Yeah. And... <laughs> That, that just goes through with, like, actually, I put myself first. I put myself first. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. 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 And then my sister and then my brother. My def- my sister's definitely the smart, book smart, like, very, very smart. And, um, but, like, in terms of, like, um, other things, like. Street smart. Yeah, street, yeah, street smart. smart. Maybe not as much, but I'm probably, like, in the middle of both, whereas my brother's the lowest of both. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. I see that. Yeah. yeah, to me too. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if I probably never told you this. One of the first times I met Sam, he claimed that he was benching, I think, one hundred and fifty, um, which is interesting. Yeah. I uh, also don't know if it was true. I don't think it was, but that, yeah, that's one of the first interactions with him was, mm. "Hey, man, I, I can actually bench one hundred and fifty. Yeah. So he must have been pretty big. He was. He was quite like. He probably he was did. swimming and he was yeah. gymming. Always playing rugby. So yeah. I think he did. Bench 150. Right. Not many people believe this when I say it, but I benched 180 before. Okay. Pounds? No, kilos. I We, we used to have like a powerlifting coach there. You did serious? Yeah, 100%. Right. And um, <laughs> one of my closest friends back then, he did, I think, 210. 210. So, um, yeah, we, we were like so into it every day. Like, um yeah, like we were nat- I was natural. I don't know if my friend was. He always denies it to this day, but he says he's natural. He's never, yeah. But um, yeah, we were so into it. We like lived to go to the gym and lift lift weights. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sam. I doubted you. <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of people did. <laughs> but not, not Sam though. Not no, Sam. no, I know. But yeah. him with the whatever 150 or whatever he claimed. 
I doubt, I doubted him. Yeah, he was like, if he stuck to gym, he could have like actually been like have had a really good physique. But he did it for like a year or two, and then he didn't do it. But when he like was lifting, he was like big, like yeah, right. like he was big. He must, be, he must be enjoying this. Yeah. Um, do you know what? Do you know what stopped? Why he stopped? Like yeah. you've kind of you kind of pushed through since whatever it was ten years ago. I think he has no reason to go. So when you go to the gym, what you get some muscles. Like he just didn't have that desire or motivation to, like, to look. Good. You know, he doesn't really care about his appearance at all. Yeah. So, who would go to the gym if they didn't care? Unless they were like just like the feeling of training. But um, yeah. So I think it's just he had no reason to. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. And him being a big, like, a, he was always a big guy, like, really tall, really big. I think he was, like, 120 kilos in primary school or something. This. Yeah. Um, Dang. That seems like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's the exact number, but he was, like, yeah. And so, like, he was always, like, the biggest guy. Like, you know how big guys are not intimidated or they don't have, like, they're just a big guy, but a smaller guy is more likely to go to gym and train hard and stuff because he's, yeah, like, okay. being yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So I think he's just had the opposite of, yeah, the smaller guy, small guy syndrome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This episode is brought to you thanks to Ronin Grooming. If you're looking for a fresh cut and some quality chats, hit up Richard at Ronin Grooming, located at Wilds Gym, McGregor, and give him a follow at roningrooming.au on Instagram. So one thing that I noticed about growing up Asian um, is, especially amongst the Asian community, is everyone's really in each other's business. And there's a lot... and sometimes it's got to do with face as well. Is that something that you experienced growing up on the Gold Coast? A little bit. I think um, my parents, um, they generally stay clear of like as much drama as possible, but um, like especially in like Korean churches and those smaller communities, there's um, like everyone just likes talking about everyone. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of um, kind of like gossiping, um uh, sharing other people's business. Um, yeah, it's just like, yeah, it just seems like it's the nature of the beast with um, Korean small communities, yeah. Was there a lot of comparison between you and like family, friends or anything like that? Um, I think here and there, here and there when we we're younger, but not for a very long time. Yeah, I think uh, our parents are very um, happy with um, who we've become and who we are, and they just kind of love us unconditionally regardless, yeah. Yeah, one thing I definitely got, like, speaking to Sam and then I, now you, is that, yeah, your parents were very supportive of you guys. They kind of wanted you to be well-rounded, as he said, and it wasn't, like, to try and put extra pressure on you where, you, where they didn't have to. Yeah. And I think that's pretty important, and he always jokes, but you guys have all turned out pretty well, I think, so I guess that worked. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, it's, yeah, it's, um, I think me and my brother, we probably had a very mild Korean childhood experience. Not really mild, but more compared to other people. We were definitely, um, parents are more westernized um, and they're very relaxed and chilled and about a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, it couldn't be good and bad, but that's just, yeah, yeah. how they raised us. And then I guess before we move on to why you're really here, which is to talk about watches, um, <laughs> looking back and you said at times, you, yeah, you, again, you felt that you were out of place or ashamed of being Asian. Like, would you, What sort of advice would you give to a younger, a younger Stephen? And be like, I know, I know you did say like it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Yeah. I would say... Um not just to like Asians, but like just to anyone who's like a minority, but just be very like proud of who you are. Um, there's, yeah, it's like being a different race or compared to where you are at the, at that stage in your life is, it's, it's a good thing. And um, even though people, like if they're like um, maybe ignorant towards that, then there's nothing you can do to, change that at that point or you could try but um just know that like um yeah being just to be proud of who you are and um there's a lot of positives and good things that can come out of that yeah yeah so my last thing on that then is so culturally 
if you end up not with a Korean person. Um, I'm assuming a lot of the, not the values, but the culture and the traditions and things like that, probably speaking Korean, is going to go to the wayside. Is that something that is important to you to, to continue? It is. Um, I think it's just a big part of me. And um, it's not like a must, but it would be it would be good. And my current partner, um, Sarah, is Korean. So um, I think um, her mindset is that she wants to instill that the Korean culture in her kids as well. So, um, so I think we share the same mindset. Yeah. 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 Cause it is, it, it is something to consider. Um, it, it depends on if it's important to someone or not, but like, cause everyone's so multicultural now and, um, marrying and dating into race. Like once you go down there, it's like pretty difficult to actually continue the certain practices or cultures that you may have had as a yeah. family. Yeah. I can imagine it would be extremely hard to maintain um with the next generation but um do you guys experience that because you guys are not the um same nationality right ethnicity to an extent i think it helps that chinese and vietnamese culture is fairly similar like the language is different of course but then even within china like being chinese is different dialects too so i think at the moment i'm like we have similar like we celebrate the same festivals almost um, so I think, I don't know, I think it's, it, it is a challenge. I'm not going to lie. I think it's going to be challenging as Olivia and Charlie grow up, old, like grow older and have different friends. But I think it's really important for us to instill our culture. Like for example, just being able to celebrate Lunar New Year. Cause that to me is when you're with your family, that's really important. Um, but whether or not she speaks Vietnamese or Chinese, it is important to me, but at the same time, I'm like, it's really up to her, I think, and Charlie to decide if they want to or not, right? Because at the end of the day, I can only push them so much. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. And it probably doesn't help that Ethan doesn't speak Vietnamese either. No. Or Chinese. It doesn't help. <laughs> or Chinese. Or Chinese. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like you said, Stephen, it's, it's what actually makes you different. It's what, otherwise, you're just another Australian, which is nothing wrong with that, but having that culture and the um, heritage behind you, that does make you a little bit different. And it's, it's cool when you get older and you get comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree for sure. Yeah. But it's yeah. never too late to learn a language as well. well. He learns it in like mm. two months apparently. Because he has the foundation. But you never, you could find it. Because I have the find, intellect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Number one in streets and mm. in book smarts. <laughs> but I know, I know of like a lot of, people like Westerners who have actually learned Korean because that's how much they love K-pop and how much they love K-dramas. Um, and there's a lot of people who can speak both Chinese and Vietnamese and they aren't Vietnamese or Chinese. So that's really impressive to me yeah. as well. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get on to mm. a big reason why you're here mm. and why I probably talk to you 90% of the time is because <laughs> of watches. Yep. Um, how did you get into it? Um, it happened, I think, one year after started working. I started working. Uh, one of my close family friends is a bit, I think, is maybe five years older than me. He was really into watches and I just saw him wearing a watch one day. I was like, that's the coolest. That's such a cool thing. Yep. And from then on, I became addicted to watches until now, until this day, um, I still collect watches um, and I still love them a lot. Can you remember the first watch that started it all for you? Yes, it was a Amiga Seamaster 300 meter diver. Um, It was the one in the Pierce Brosnan movie. Um, And yeah, it's, I've I've actually got two of those to this day and, um, and they're just the, they just looked cool. It just looked very unique. And, um, i with watches. I like the aesthetics of the watch. I don't really put too much emphasis on the movement or the finishing, but I just like the aesthetics and how it looks and how it wears on the wrist. Yeah. 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 So for me, 
I remember as well, so I was young, I was probably 13 or 14, and then one of my friends from hockey won a watch. It was a Rip Cool watch from probably City Beach. And at that age, you like, don't really wear a watch, and he, and he won it, and I was like, that's so cool. And then he just looked cool wearing it. So that kind of was like, I want to get a watch at some point. And then uh, one of my colleagues that I worked with, um, he kept talking about this green Submariner, just kept talking about it. And I was like, oh, what a wanker. But then started looking <laughs> at it. And I, I would have been young. This is probably like eight, nine years ago. And that kind of put everything on the map for me. So that's when I kind of started. So that was the one that kind of started the, I mean. The Hulk. Yeah. 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 I, I agree what you mean when you said it was um egotistical. Watch collecting is a very egocentric yeah. hobby. Like it's like um people treat it as like a um like a like a statement or like which is true you're so a better guy if you have a good watch yeah so it's it's a which is true it's a there's the hobby is like has a lot of people like who think with that and everyone has it to an extent yeah. um with watch collecting so there's a very interesting group of people who are into it yeah yes yeah, so obviously you're much on a different level to most because you have the experience and i guess the means to do it we were joking one time when I bought something about that feeling, the feeling once you buy something. What's your kind of take on it? And can you explain it to someone who hasn't actually had that feeling? Uh, I'd say the feeling when you try the watch on and it just sits perfectly on the wrist, aesthetically it looks perfectly. That's, you know, there's just a feeling that you get like, I need to own this watch. Um, and... I haven't felt that about too many watches, um, but there are a few which uh, come to mind where I felt this is perfect for me. Yeah. Can you share what those watches are, or which uh, which those? Yeah, which one of those watches are? Yeah, I'd say one of them that comes to mind is I'll go two. So one would be the Cartier Santos, um, and I, I I own this at the moment. I actually bought it to celebrate. Um, me buying into my the first physio practice um so i knew i had owned that watch probably three or four times before and sold it but i always knew that i would buy that watch brand new and be the first original owner and just keep it for my whole life so um yeah the cartier santos would be one yeah because i've actually asked you to bring a couple and just to talk about it so obviously the first one is the santos that we're gonna yeah and that's the story behind it which is cool yes yeah. It's got significance to you more than it just looks cool. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's probably the only sentimental watch I own. Um, and the other one would probably be the Rolex Daytona. Um, it's Rolex have a, a wide range of sports watches, and they're all sitting at forty millimeter mostly. The the like the the ones that are really sought after, but. <laughs> the, the Daytona is one that's a really well, it was considered popular, but it also fits on a smaller wrist like mine very well. So, um, yeah, that would be my second one. And aesthetically, it's just very like a perfect watch. Yeah. yeah. And then what about the feeling post buying? Well, <laughs> we were joking about the one that I've got recently, and you're like, "Have you got that feeling yet?" And I was like, "I think so." <laughs> I think. Um, It can be, it, it depends on how you acquire the watch. So if you've been chasing after this watch for like two years and you have to pay like a very high price for it, the initial feeling could be, oh, this is it. Like, oh, it's not as much as I thought it was. Um, but so it really depends on how you acquire it. If you just get it like, just run into it and you get it, you don't really think too much. Um have yeah. you ever had buyer's remorse? Well, that's that's the feeling um, yeah. where, and like we were talking about it, when you chase something and you're watching videos yeah. about it, you're seeing pictures, and then once you put it on, you're like, hmm, okay, that's mm. that's it. So I have buyer's remorse for 95% of the watches I buy. Oh, my gosh, um, yeah. I don't know if you know, Ethan, but I like buy and sell watches yes. frequently. Yeah. And I'm always chasing the perfect watch for me. And the ones that I have, the 
Explorer and the Santos, they're the ones that I found perfect. Everything else, even all the other, like I've probably got 15 at the moment, the other 12, 13, they're ex- expendable. Um, but yeah, I get buyer's remorse for most of my watches. And then tell us about the yeah. Explorer, which is the other one that you brought today. Uh, is there any cool story behind how you got that? There isn't. There isn't. Um, I like it. Yeah, I just, it's the, it's the Rolex that you wear when you don't want people to know you have a Rolex. So it's very discreet, understated, still a Rolex sports steel watch and aesthetically very simple and perfect. So it's just a three-hander, time only. Yep. And um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, I'd say Explorer is very good for like everyday wear and the Santos is good for maybe if you want to show that you have a nice watch. Yeah. And how does someone go about it? Because you go to an authorised dealer, they'll either laugh at you or tell you to piss off because they've got no stock, talking about Rolex specifically. Yeah. What's your advice to someone who actually wants one, who can afford one, but can't find one? you got to pay to play. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's people that have been on waiting lists for years and the waiting list is essentially like, a fake list. They that's like, literally how I feel. I've been on the, yeah. like multiple for about seven years. Yeah, I think so. I have received mm. phone calls as well to say if I'm like to ask if I'm still interested. I'm like, yes, I'm still interested, and I'm like, does that mean that it actually exists? This list. Yeah. Like when I get a phone call, but otherwise, that's ha- exactly how I feel. That I'm like, mm. it's a fake list. Yeah, and it's um, it's like um, it's just it all depends on purchase history. Um, like what you bought from that shop. And if they deem you as a worthy customer in the future to continue shopping with them. So I know a guy who's never, he bought one ladies steel model, 7,000. After that, he got multiple, like he got the multiple sports watches um, from them, which are really sought after. As soon as he buys them, he can make 10, 15 K profit on them. Um, And just because he, they saw him with potential to shop there more. He's not going to, but um yeah, because he's like very confident, very wealthy, and he just gives off that persona. But if someone like, I don't want to degrade myself, but someone like myself went in there, they would, with no purchase history or just buying that, they would not sell me the watch for sure. And I know that because I buy and sell watches a lot, that I will never get one from a shop. I've been told that from like friends that work there. Um <laughs> which is okay because, but I honestly, if I got a shop, a watch from a shop, like I wouldn't resell it, but because I do like pre-owned watches, buy and sell, it's just like the chances of me selling it are much higher than other people. That's how they see it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fair enough. Yeah. But like, um, with like, I would like say, if you like the watch and you, you can afford it, just get it because, um, like you might not, even want the watch in a few years time or something might happen. If you want the watch that much, if it's not too crazy premium, then just go for it. Yeah. And how consuming is it time wise and mental wise? Extremely, extremely time consuming. Yeah. Um, Because I'm always looking out for like a good deal, um, a good watch. I'm looking on all the pages constantly throughout the day so it's a very um it's a very mentally draining as well and stuff can go wrong you can buy a pre-owned watch and something could be fake or something um there could be something wrong with the movement which you didn't pick up on so um it can be a lot of stress involved as well yeah yeah Yeah. so like obviously you've helped me make some decisions and things like that um what, what would you say to someone who's just trying to get in, talk to other people? What would, what would the best advice be? I would say buy what you like. Um, don't buy what's good for resale or what other people what other people think are popular. Everyone's got a different size wrist, so some watches don't fit, fit a lot of people's wrists. And that was one of the mistakes I made. I've got a very slim wrist, but everyone said, these were the best, get this, get this, but it just doesn't fit. So try it on. Um, get what fits you and buy what you like and just enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, watches I seek. I think it's, it's your page or someone's page. Yeah. Watch, watch I seek. Watch is, I seek. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Check it out. It's, there's some cool stuff in there. Yeah. If you're interested. Um, 
And then I guess the last thing on that is why do you think there's such a fascination now with wristwatches, mechanical wristwatches, as opposed to, let's say, 10, 15 years ago? I'd say social media um, blew the watch market up the last three, four years. Yeah. Um, people are aware of these models, um, whereas people wouldn't even previously notice a watch on a, on a person. Now they're very exposed to it creates the hype train and people just want what they can't get and then um and then it just creates a cycle so that's what's happened and um and the watch brands have contributed by limiting production to create this exclusivity but um yeah i'd say that's why it's become more popular and also in terms of jewelry and like the world we live in and in terms of like out people taking care of their appearance or sh- want to sh- like show stuff off, a watch is one thing a guy can have, which which um they can use to do that because we don't have many accessories. Yep. Um, so I'd say that's also a very uh, common reason. Yeah, yeah, like a statement piece, and guys, like you don't wear a belt. If you're a belt, you kind of look a bit douchey in the nicest yeah. way possible. You can't really carry a bag again because yeah. yeah. I'd yeah. say it's like a, a respect, like a respect you're trying to get. Um, in a way, yeah. yeah. And like the people who know what watch you're wearing, like yeah, like you know. Well, oh, you, don't, you don't wear the watch to impress women, right? You wear it to impress, not other, to guys. impress other guys, but other guys will notice. I person, yeah, that will definitely happen. But I always like it if it impresses me. I know it's a bit cheesy, but. As long as I like looking at it, and every time I look at a watch, I'm like, "Oh wow!" Yep. That's the that's definitely the most important thing for me, yeah. like self uh, satisfaction and just admiring it myself. But yeah, I guess I would I'd be lying if I said like, "Oh, when someone says like, oh, nice watch, Stephen," and it, it does make me feel like good in some way, yep. but it's not yeah, it's not like the sole reason, I guess. Yeah. So my last two then is one: what's what's driving you now? Because like you say, you're buying, selling. You've got you said 15 in the in the collection at the moment yeah is it to find that perfect one or is it for profit you can be honest what what's um, driving you right now i'd say both so uh finding the perfect collection is always my goal like if if i didn't have that desire it, the buying and selling wouldn't be worth it because i yeah. still get enjoyment out of it um profit is definitely one because i always buy buy at a good price where i can move it either at the same price or higher. Um, so I'd say both of those would, I'd say the first one is the most important. Um, but if I was losing money, I probably wouldn't do it as well. Like if I was just buying, selling, losing money with each watch, then I'd be like, I want to be more objective about this. I'm yep. not going to, I'm not going to do this anymore, but because it does, it, sometimes it does turn out that I do make money. It's, um, it's good, but I've lost money as well. So yeah. yeah well, thanks for the honesty. And then the last one is what's the what's the grail right now for you? So unlimited money, unlimited access. What's okay. the grail? Um, I'd say I recently picked up a rose gold Daytona um, with the ivory dial, and I thought that was going to be like a really special piece for me. But the precious metal ones, like with rose gold, yellow gold, they wear as tad bigger. And I still want a Daytona back, so I'm after a steel Daytona. If anyone's selling one, um, I'm looking. <laughs> yeah, hit Stephen up. Stephen will hit you up. Yeah. And then just before Alex does a little quick rapid fire um, with you, what's what's next for you? So not necessarily about watch collecting, actually not at all about watch collecting. Well, what's next for you personally? So I recently, with my two business partners, started a physiotherapy, a new physiotherapy clinic. Um, in Underwood, I think it's been maybe three or four months ago. Yeah. So um, my goal is to, I guess, grow that and just make it a respectable clinic in the in the neighbourhood that people can go to. Um, that's probably my next short term goal. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And also to um, to. I guess progress things within my relationship at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, hopefully Sarah's, that happens. Yeah, I was going to say, Sarah's a very lucky girl. 
Did I say did I say a name before? Yeah, you did. Yeah. So we can cut it out if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what I was gonna say, yeah. So I mean, personally, when I had my calf injury, um, I s- sought out your treatment, and it was good. So yeah, um, yeah, you guys are doing good things, and congratulations on the physios. And it's good. It seems like everything's going well. So that's appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. It's yeah. easy. Well, yeah. Alex is gonna just ask a couple of questions and. Don't think too much about the answers, kind of whatever comes to mind. Yep, it's just rapid fire, whatever comes. Okay, so who do you go to when you need advice? Um, okay, I think um, my like serious stuff, I'd say it's called Samonim in Korea. She's like a, um, she's a pastor um, at a church, in, but she's like kind of not too much older than me, really cool, just... Just awesome, awesome person. So yeah, I'd say um, Julia, the pastor. Oh wow, yeah. interesting. How did you meet her? Just quickly. Uh, just growing up, I've gone to her church, and um, she's always like doing um, a lot of. She's very active in the church community. So um, yeah, just through that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Shout out to Dami Yim. <laughs> on the podcast as well. <laughs> is, um, da- is Dami coming on? Yeah, so she's friends with Sam. So <laughs> Sam, Sam was going to organise that one for us. Because he's Korean? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is your biggest priority at the moment? Um, relationship. Nice. What is your greatest accomplishment? Physio clinic. Physio clinic. Yeah. If money didn't matter, what would be your dream job? Own a watch shop. Mm. It's doable. Um, how would others describe you in three words? I'd say just easygoing, uh, awkward, <laughs> uh, loyal. Nice. Mm. Yep. Yeah. What's one thing you would change about yourself? Can be physically. Uh, to be physically. I think my calves are quite skinny, so I'd probably get some calf implants if I could um, <laughs> take the plunge. Yeah. Nice. If, you, if you know any good any good surgeons out there, hit me up. <laughs> calf implants. Did you, did you watch Entourage? Yeah, I did. <laughs> John Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, and he had he had like decent sized cars as well. Cars. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Ridiculous. Well, yeah. What do you do to relax? Uh, I watch uh, Korean dramas. Like any spe- any type of genre. Um, I like action. I like yeah. I I like all like, but just something that's very um Related exciting, well. exciting, yeah, exciting. Yeah. When was the last time you tried something new? I think I went to brunch not too long ago. Yeah, and that was a new experience. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I don't really, honestly, do many new. This isn't how. This is a quick thing. Like one word answer. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Yeah. No, it's great. No, yeah. it, you already answered, but you can elaborate. Yeah. yeah. So I never. I actually never try new things. Like I try and limit that as much as possible. But yeah, brunch would be one. Why is that? I don't. I think I'm just comfortable with what I'm used to. Um, but I think it's like a something that I'm looking to start doing is getting out of my comfort zone a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, it's like, I thought maybe it'd be like something to do with being scared of disappointment. It's kind of like, you know, when you go to a brunch place and you always order the same thing and then you see someone eat something you're like, you know what, I'm going to try oh. that today. And then you eat it and you're like, yeah. should have gone with what I normally go for. Yeah. It's not as good. Yeah. I think I'm a bit like that, but I do also like trying new, new things. things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. Well, um, I guess if you have a shout out to to the clinics. Please check them out. Mm. Watch I Seek, mm. another interesting page. Um, mm. Straw Hat Stephen <laughs> got some funny, uh, funny content mm. coming out for everyone. Mm. And um, let's see. Thanks to Sam as well for mm. being your older brother. Otherwise, we would have never met you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to shout out or um, give thanks to right now? I'd say um, to say thanks to Terry I th- I'd say shouting out um, my care physio because um it's a clinic that I work at and my two business partners they're really good people and really I'm very lucky to um be able to work with them um so shout out to them um and with Sam uh I'm actually planning on taking his position here oh, yeah, um, nice. when, right. if he ever comes back I don't know what the plan is but 
um, I'd I'd be asking when he comes back if there's some kind of tryout because like he can't just expect to come back. No, and, he's no way he can slip back in. Yeah. No. So um. Yeah. No. <laughs> so yeah, I'd um, I don't know how you how I've gone today, but I'd be even willing to get lessons like on how to speak properly. <laughs> if, um, <laughs> done a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um. Yeah. So Sam um. It's going to be um, me and Ethan from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for your time. Appreciate um, it. Appreciate everything. We're definitely going to get you back on, talk about some more watches, other ones. Um, interesting stories about how you acquired them. I think people really want to know because so many people want things, but they just can't get them. So, but I appreciate the time, man. Thanks Looking again. forward to it. Thank you for having me. No Thank worries. you. Thank uh, you. Cheers. Cheers.